Hello everybody and welcome to today's um, series, uh, talk, design talk in the, in the Myers Touch design series that we've been running for quite a long while now. I'm imagining that most of you are um, zooming in because you either have an interest in starting a project or perhaps you're in the middle of a project. And for some of you, you may have been having these ideas were around for your head for quite a while and other you, others of you are very new to the game, never done a project before and are trying to pick as many brains as possible, which is great and I'm glad you've come to us and I hope that we will be able to offer you something really tangible tonight to help with the projects that you have coming up. We have been running the design series of talks here at the Myers Touch for a number of years now and um, earlier on in uh, the life of the design series, we were holding them in the studio because we have a beautiful studio here in Winchester, an award-winning studio. And it was lovely to get people in and to meet and give the lectures in the studio itself so that you could actually have a look at some of the kitchens and project products that we're using. Uh, but obviously over the last season of the last year, things have been a little different and we've transferred this to Zoom talks. Uh, we're not by any means calling ourselves Zoom experts. Um, technology is still, we're still grappling with it every day, but nevertheless, we want to be able to bring you from the studio a sense of, um, of helping you with your projects. Now, the ideas for some of our presentations are really birthed by the experience that we've had in talking with our clients over the season of the years that we've been working, about 17 or so now. And the questions that have been key to, um, key to them really wanting the answers to, um, to help them with their journey. So we've been running uh, talks such as uh, big kitchens, small kitchens, and talks such as the five top tips, uh, five best things to have in your kitchen. But tonight, we're gonna to be taking a different look not just at inside the kitchen, but more about how you start. And uh, today we're looking at the five steps in planning your kitchen project. So really, we're really zooming back quite a lot and saying, okay, we've got a project on the go. Well, we want to start one. We've got an idea at least what happens now. What's the best timing um, for everything? And how should I even approach this whole new topic? So we'd like you to take you through a short PowerPoint presentation that um, will, for about 40 minutes between Keith and myself, that will hopefully help you with this. Here's a picture of our studio. So you can perhaps just sit back and imagine that you're actually walking up those steps. You've come through our doors and you're actually in our um, kitchen studio as we speak. But of course, you'll probably sat with a glass of wine on a comfy chair instead, and that's great. So there we go. Let's just start with a timeline. Um, Keith, if you could move, that's it, that's great. Um, I just want to start with a, a really quick timeline um, as to how we see um, a project from start to finish. The first thing is the idea or the need. Um, some of us may need kitchens, uh, kitchen living spaces um, done pretty quickly because perhaps we've had a leak in the ceiling or um, some appliances are not working or something's really not working for us. But for others, it's an idea. We've been in our homes perhaps for a little while and uh, maybe during the situation where you've been in your homes a bit longer than normal, you've been thinking this isn't quite working how I'd like it to be. I'm trying to work from my home. I'm trying to live from my home, cook from my home. The family is at home doing homework. Uh, I have a need. I have an idea for something better. That's, that's the starting place. That's great. Then we need to start thinking ahead. This is so critical. So many people come to us in what we would say is too late. Um, uh, they've already done a, a, some research, they've set the ball rolling. Maybe they've even had planning permission for an extension or a new build. Uh, they haven't yet thought about the kitchen itself because they're hoping that that will come later down the line. Uh, well, let me perhaps give you one of the biggest pieces of advice that we can to straight, straight off. It is, it can never be too early to come to see a kitchen designer. What we prefer to do is help with the inside 
out as well as the outside in. And if we approach design from the two angles together, then we'll really get synergy between the timings. So after we've done that little bit of thinking ahead, then comes the research. This perhaps, listening to a design talk is one of your pieces of research. And if you've already come down the line and got to this area, that's great. Um, there's a lot of things to research when you're looking at a kitchen. Some of the things you'll have thought of way before you come to see us, but many of the things that we'll ask you to research will be prompted by conversations that we have with you. Um, so research is critical. Then you'll have to engage the professionals. Uh, that may be an architect, it may be an architect's technician, builder, electricians, plumbers, you may have interior designers, but definitely a kitchen designer. And I mean a kitchen designer rather than a kitchen planner. If you're thinking of being creative in your kitchen and you want something to be long lasting and effective and to consider the space that you're planning into. And then, of course, you'll have lots of decisions to make and making informed decisions means you need to seek expertise to get them. And then finally, the dream will be realised. So that's the little journey that we aim to take you on and plan for uh, all kitchen projects should start in this way. Let me hand over to Keith. Over to me. Just, uh, quickly. Oh, here we go. Well, welcome from me. Um, it's lovely to have you um, with us tonight. Um, so just carrying on from where Helena is talking about, we want to talk about what we call reverse engineering your kitchen design, which sounds a kind of funny thing, but, but actually the question, the very first question um, really probably you need to ask yourself with regards to, to the planning side is, well, when do you actually want it installed? And so therefore, once you've set your date, for example, um, you know, it might be six months away, a year away, whenever it might be, you then can plan back um, uh, a schedule um, from that point to deliver all the way back so you know certain milestones when you uh, need to achieve um, certain things. Uh, you'd be absolutely amazed at how many people uh, come into us and say, oh, um, I, need a, I need a kitchen for the 14th of Feb um, and can you design it for me and do it? And there's just absolutely no time. So there is a really interesting point here is that how long does it actually take to do the project and generally speaking people underestimate how involved it is to be able to do it well it's very easy to go into a place as it were and there is some companies that provide products that you can literally as it were take out of a warehouse for example ikea might be one of those and flat pack it and take it home then and there and install it that weekend but to be honest with you, that's really not what we're about. It's not what we do. And to be honest with you, to get really good design, it's it's not um, uh, a kind of a great way to do it, but it has a fantastic place for light for light replacement or very simple uh, design, design work. So then thinking about the whole starting point of where we want to go is one of the most important things, I think, is considering the third parties that need to be involved in a project. Now, obviously, if Helena has just mentioned about if planning consent is required uh, for an extension or, um, or for a new build type house, then there's that natural expectation that you will find an appropriate uh, architect or designer to do that. We actually do do some extension design work ourselves here. Um, and then you go into this process of exploring um, what that extension might look like, what size it is, what the designs are, where the windows go. Um, and actually, Helena touched on the point of the inside outside. What we're actually doing is we're often designing the exterior of the building and then also designing the interior to make sure that the relationship between them is working really, really well. Um, but actually, interesting, if you're going for planning, you can be sometimes talking of three to six months to take a basic extension through planning. That's assuming there's no problems or you have any issues that you might need to deal with. On top of that, then you'll be dealing with some sort of building regs. Um, now, building regs, which is, if you don't know what it is, is the technical requirements that the, the government or the council set for the can, in the construction industry to ensure quality of build and of safety. Really, really important to do. And if you've ever done anything on your home, um, electrical wise or anything like that, you will find that you'll have certification, which you need to keep if you ever sell your house uh, to prove that you've complied to the building codes um, that are there. So um, you have this plate to do. Building regs can take um, just a few days and it can actually take a few weeks to be able to do that. 
So then the next stage we're coming into is design time. Well, how long does it take to design a kitchen? Well, actually, to be honest with you, it could take a few minutes, a few hours to do. And to put it together, you could probably, I think I've actually done one um, in a week. Um, and that's because it was pretty much predefined. The clients were very clear what they wanted. And they came with so us, we went through the basic things and it worked really well. Other kitchens have taken a long time to do because some clients need a lot of time in the thought process. They need to test all the options that are available to think about the things. So the value and the time that you're spending that design time is really important and really critical. And you don't want to be rushed in it. So therefore make sure that you have enough time. If you are feeling rushed, you can make the wrong decisions. And I always say to clients that if you inside something isn't sat right with you, that's your intuition or your gut feel telling you there's something not quite right. And that's when you need the help of an expertise to unravel what that issue is and to sort that out. And then when you basically come to the point of making a decision, um, again, you need to consider a, a kitchen is a high value item and it's a very important decision. And as I, if you've seen some of my other talks, I talk about um, uh, buying a kitchen is like walking down the aisle, you know, choosing your, your, your partner for the rest of your life. Don't rush into it because once that kitchen is installed, it's there for a long time and it's very expensive to replace. That's why at the Myers Touch here, we don't have sales or promotions by closing at the end of the month or do this by this time because we don't want to force the decision time so people start making mistakes through that process. And the last point that I wanted to touch on is how long does it take to manufacture something? I touched on earlier, there is products you can buy off the shelf. So obviously the lead time on those is, is, quite, is quite quick. But the manufacturing time is, is made up really of once you place an order with a manufacturer, you need to confirm those details, make sure the order is accurate, then it needs to go into manufacturing process. Now that confirmation time can easily take a couple of weeks to be able to do to and fro in from a supplier to make sure it's accurate basic lead times will be in the minimum of four weeks or four to six weeks. Some products we've had on 12 to 15 week lead times. And then you have to have that item delivered uh, from the supplier to the, um, the warehouse or onto site, wherever that is. So it can go on for quite a long time um, to do that. And these are really important things to consider consider what is the value of spending enough time in the design process and I just wanted to give you an example of a project here which looks absolutely stunning and I'd say if you walked in that that project it was in a magazine a, a few years ago um, which we were delighted about um, very unusual design um, and when you looked at it, you would see no problems or no errors with that um, kitchen at all and if I didn't tell you this which I'm about to you wouldn't know about it Here's a couple of site shots, so it's not great um, here. And you can just see that the alignment from the window here is not meeting the position of this. It's about half a meter difference between the two. And if you come across to the other side, you'll see exactly the same down here on the other side where the alignment to that window is not right. And what happened is the way that the client built this extension is where you see this seating through here, there's a, a, a passage and a corridor that comes from the main part of the house into this extension. And he wanted the doors lined up with the uh, with that passageway with the window at the end. And of course, you look at it, and the kitchen is offset. And when we went back for this photo shoot, which you saw earlier, is I asked him if there's anything he would have done differently, and he said, "Yeah, this wall here, where these tall units are on the side, should have been half a meter bigger on the extension in order to line up to that window." So very simple. Um, error or, or mistake he brought us in too late and when we got there the building was already in place so we didn't have any influence on changing that so over to Helena. I'd just go to go back slightly on that um, and just another point is there is also of course on top of the manufacturing time comes delivery times and of course with the um, Brexit situation at the moment, we have got extended delivery, and then there's an installation time. And just to let you know, because not everybody is aware that the installation of a kitchen can generally take up two to possibly three weeks. And there's normally something that needs adjustment. So that can stretch over into other weeks, although not in full, you can get use of the kitchen. So we are generally saying that 
beyond uh, about 20 weeks is about the minimum that you should really be looking for the creation of a design and installation of the kitchen and that is pushing it that really is that's somebody who's speedy at making decisions uh wants something that hasn't got too long a lead time and we've actually got installations teams that are available so um do do push your calendars out when you're forward thinking uh, so yes to, to carry on next to the um the why what and who um so this is the this is the research area of your timeline. Um, you're you're looking at um, these three big categories. And first of all, I'd just say that the main thing to think about is your needs. Why are you actually starting this project in the first place? What are the things that have propelled you? Are they push factors? As in, I can't stand this anymore. Um, I, I need to get away from where I am. Or they pull factors. Oh, I'd really love something or I've seen this or, you know, I've got some money. I'd like to spend it. Um, there are push factors and pull factors. And um, sometimes we have both working together. But the needs, what I'd suggest that you look at is the deeper needs. So we've all heard the little phrase, you know, um, you don't go to buy a drill because you want a drill. Um, you buy a drill. And then the next thing is you buy a drill because you want a hole on the wall. And of course, nobody needs a hole in the wall. What do we really need? Well, we want a hanging thing to put something in. No, we don't. We want a picture on the wall. Well, what do we really want? We don't want a picture on the wall or a hole in the wall or a hanging thing or a drill. We actually want something beautiful to look at, to enjoy while we're in the room. So this process of getting behind that, well, I'd like a brand new kitchen. Why do you want a brand new kitchen? Is it because perhaps uh, you've got a growing family, uh, the needs for the family are different, they you, you used to be one thing and now they're another, and you actually want to um, have your family around you more? Is it perhaps that your family have left home, your children have left, they've gone over, away to university, and now you are actually without them, now this is a space for you to create with a different mood, mood, perhaps a little bit more intimacy, or perhaps to be prepared for the ebb and flow of family life when they come and go. Maybe, and probably quite um, importantly in these days, You've got a desire for flexibility. Our kitchens are being stretched to the limit at the moment. We are not just cooking in our kitchens. We're not just preparing food. We're not even just eating food. We are working in our kitchens. We are helping our children do their homework in the kitchens. We are wanting these to be um, places where we can relax, um, where we can engage with one another, where we can play games, where we can um, actually do paperwork or even, you know, technology, all in the kitchen. We really do want our kitchens to be the be all and every, every, uh, be all of everything. Uh, and as the hub of the home, as the, the place where we want to be, we need to look at how flexible we can make our kitchens. Maybe that's the need that you have right now. Um, so I would suggest that you make a start to make a little list and think about the heart reasons why you do want a new kitchen. In other words, what would the outcome of that kitchen to be for you? So perhaps it would be um, for some of us who are a little more logically minded, um, we might think, oh, I want less clutter. I want more storage space. These are very practical elements. But maybe underneath that all, you can have a listen to your heart and see whether the driving factors for those things might be, I actually feel that I'm rushing around a lot or I'm doing a lot of work and I want my kitchen to be a place of order in order to bring me some calm. In other words, you need to be thinking about what are the well-being things that are helping drive the need for your kitchen, well-being in relationship with your family members, well-being in, in having space that's both private and both opens up. When we do have the opportunity to bring friends and family back into our home and do some entertaining, there's a sense of wonderful celebration and well-being that we're going to feel at that time. We want our kitchens to be ready for that celebratory moment. So what are our needs? Think about the heart, what your heart is calling you. And perhaps if it's a bit hard for you, if heart is a bit ethereal, ask yourself a different question. What would make, what brings me delight? Does 
the view out of my kitchen window bring me delight? Is that something that I need to bring into my kitchen? Uh, do I need to make that a central focus? Is it about the cooking itself? Am I one who loves to, to um, experiment with my cooking? I love to have everything out on the counter and taste everything and, and create this wonderful expression of food. Um, and if so, well, how am I gonna do that? Who, what am I gonna face while I'm doing that? Do I want engagement with a person in front of me? What's gonna make me happy? What's gonna make me happy at the end of the day when cooking's over, sitting's over, uh, and I'm in my kitchen, perhaps with a glass of wine. What's going to make me happy? Is it going to be something to do with the lighting, the soft, comfortable seating that I don't want to move away quickly from? Things that are going to make you delighted, really important. Um, next, I would say really critically is the partners. Who are you going to choose for partners in this? Um, We've talked before about some of the areas, some of the different people that could be involved in your project from electricians and plumbers and architects, etc. Um, but I'm thinking now on a different level, not just who in terms of what profession are you going to call in, but how are you going to engage with those partners? The reason that they're looking for them needs to go through a selection process. Um, and so uh, how are you going to align with those partners? Keith will talk a little bit about this a little bit later on, but choosing your partners is really key to having the right outcome of the things that you have planned in your mind, because not everybody can take your dream out of you and, and then bring it. Now we have a really consultative process here at the Myers Touch. Uh, we ask a lot of questions that if you went to perhaps any usual studio, you may not be asked. Um, in fact, we often have, I think even yesterday, we had a design uh, consultation with somebody. It was about two or three hours and it never got onto the product level at that point. It was the first conversation, uh, three hours, and it was all about engaging with the needs, the desires, the aims, the purpose of the space as a whole and as of the community that are living here. Product definitely comes, but it comes much further down the line. So when you're choosing your partner, are you gonna ch choose a partner who's able to hear what you have to say and take you down the right series of questions to get from you the result in order to produce your dream kitchen? And of course, um, one of the things you can do, you're here tonight, you're listening to the design talk. We have a whole series of, of them and they're posted onto YouTube. So if you go and have a look at the Myers Touch on YouTube, you'll see some of our design talks on there already. And you can either play catch up or you can um, keep look, logging in because we do roughly one a month and the next one is coming up in February and that will be looking at do designers play it safe, uh, which is another really interesting topic. Um, and so I would suggest that your resource and your research is very much utilizing everything that we have and the tools that we have to help you. Oops. Oops. Just wanted to show you a little bit, oh, a little example um, of a kitchen where somebody um, came to us and they partnered with us because they knew that we would have exceptional creativity for something that they had a dream of in their head and could never couldn't see anybody doing. So um, a lovely couple had a uh, a wonderful uh, view of at the Spinnaker Tower in Portsmouth. So they could see the outside, they love the outside boating world, and they wanted something to represent a boat in their kitchen. Oh, they knew they couldn't have a boat in their kitchen, although it was a thought at one point. It wasn't practical, however, because it didn't have the storage. So uh, we came up with this beautiful kitchen um, and it looks right over the Spinnaker Tower. So a couple of photographs of where we've partnered with a client um, to find out what their dream is and then find the outcome that will fully express what they have. And you'll see in the background of this picture are also a glass splashback with turtles in. The turtles are this client's favourite animal. And of course, 
when you're talking about bringing delight into a kitchen into a kitchen space and um, every time a client is in here they are delighted because they're reminded of their favorite animals and uh, they have a boat in their kitchen here's just another couple of uh, shots from the outside in just to show you the detail that went into that little raised breakfast bar that reflects the nature of the spinnaker tower outside. Okay. Great. Uh, back to me. Um, believe it or not, we're over halfway, but yet we're not over halfway the presentation, which is always when we're planning these presentations, we kind of think, oh, what we're going to talk about. And actually, we're already running behind. So we're going to probably go over the 40 minutes, and I hope that's um, not a problem. Um, but uh, hopefully you find it interesting and want to stay with us. So getting um, value for your investment is point number three, um, which is a really kind of interesting thing is about how much you need to spend. Um, and that's really interesting, I think, here, because um, what do we actually mean by value? Um, what, what do we um, need to apply into a project to be able to do that? And people ask us the questions, well, how much are your kitchens? Or how much is a kitchen? Well, how much is a kitchen? And I often ask them the question, well, how much is a car or how much is a vacation? I mean, we could, if one wanted to um, spend a few pounds, go to a camping site um, in a nice tent, have a lovely holiday for a couple of weeks. And, you know, you may not have spent more than a few hundred pounds or that you can very easily fly to a very exotic destination and spend multiple thousands of pounds for a very different experience. And people choose um, different things and different ways of approaching their projects and particularly along the aspect of value. So let me ask you a question. When was the last time you bought a kitchen and how much was it? Well, it's interesting. I think particularly um, we find that people are probably changing their kitchens that we see maybe every 10, 15, 20 years, probably at key stages of their life. The UK kitchen average replacement is every seven years. Um, and that's because there's a lot of throwaway type kitchens in the industry and things like students and buy to lets and those sorts of things. But, but actually, when you think about last time you may have replaced it or never replaced it, there's been so much change in the industry over that time, variations of cost and opportunities. You can very easily spend various sums um, on a kitchen, um, but based very much on certain values and, and conditions. And they're very personal to you. They can be about the use of colors and materials, certain textures and feels. The size can be about investing things. There's certain technologies now that are really important for some people. For example, if you want to have hot water in your kitchen for making a cup of tea, you can spend 20 pounds on a kettle, or you could go and spend anything between one to 3,000 pounds on a boiling chilled water sparkling tap that can give you all these things in a thing. And you spend money on those things only if they are real value to you. But then real nuts and bolts of it, how do you even begin to assign a budget? Flexible or fixed is what we put here. And there's two styles that we really see. The first thing where people come to us and say, you know, I want to spend 20,000, 40,000, 80,000, 100,000 pounds, whatever it is, it doesn't really matter what the sum is. Um, and that's my absolute limit. And I don't want to go over that. And that's fine, we, we can absolutely work to those sorts of things. And it's made, of, uh, that amount is then made all the little decisions. So when you're planning your kitchen, um, the cost of your kitchen is very much like um, your credit card bill. All those little choices that you make on your credit card bill and you look at the final amount, think, goodness gracious me, they've made a mistake. How on earth did I get here? I've, I must've been robbed, I've been scammed. So when you go back and check all the amounts and it's all correct, and you think, okay, well, I have spent whatever it is, £3,000 this month. Gosh, that's a lot of money and uh, didn't realise that that was the case. Well, kitchens are exactly the same. And if you're doing this type of thing where you're setting the budget right at the very beginning and you don't want to go over it, go for the dream, go for what you desire, go for what you like, enjoy it, but then come back into a conversation if the budget isn't working out as expected because there's always ways that things can be tweaked and adjusted. Appliances is a massive part of a budget these days of a kitchen. There's many different suppliers, many different gadgets and systems, some of them really, really good, really excellent, but sometimes they'll push you over your budget. The other way that we do it is what we call the flexible budget, which is this whole thing where clients say, well, I don't really have a budget. Um, and the reality is, is they do have a budget, but what they're kind of saying to us in one degree is, well, 
I want to do this right. I don't want to skimp on it, but I don't want to overspend. And that is a value-based decision is overspending is, well, I have this little kind of limit in my mind of how much I think I need to spend. But the other side of it is saying, well, I don't want to undervalue it because this needs to last me for our retirement. And I don't want to be changing this again in the next 20 years or 30 years or whatever. So I want to do it right and I want to do it well. Again, it's a really personal um, thing. And again, it's very similar to the credit card bills. You then build it the other way rather than setting the top. You come back and you start to set the dreams and then you look at the value or you look at the cost and say, OK, how does that sit with you? Is, is that is that right? It, you know, it's a client's money. They can spend it on whatever they want. We don't control that. Um, we just guide people through the process of, of choosing and helping them to know what to do. So a very good way. And I think here it's called chunking, which is a lovely kind of ways of chunking your your budget up. And there actually is a a short talk that I've done um, on YouTube. And also there's a, a blog on our website um, called How to Budget Your Kitchen. And it's really some practical ways. And very briefly, we break it down into five different sections and you're assigning a cost to every one of those sections. And that will really help you to begin to set it. And some of that you can do some proper going out and checking and getting actual figures and numbers to do it. And otherwise, other places you can set parts of the budget. And if you add that all up and it's too much, then we have to come back and relook at that. So that's a great little way to, um, to do that. And you'll find that on YouTube if you um, would like to, to do that. Here's just uh, an example, a really beautiful kitchen we did in Hiltonbury, um, just south of Winchester, a lovely little place to live. Um, and why I put this one up is because when the client came to us, their, their, their first thing was, oh, we've had another quote from another company and they're kind of messing us around. And it was, for us, it was a friend of a friend. So they said, could you just, quote, I know you're quite quite expensive and things like this, which is, you know, we're not actually, sometimes we can do expensive. Uh, we can spend a lot of money sometimes, but actually a lot of the stuff we do is actually very competitive and really well done. And this situation, we, we, we designed a light for light, we copied the light for light kitchen that they'd already given us the plans for. And actually we were, we were just a little bit more, not by much, a thousand pounds or something. So really in the whole grand scheme of things, it wasn't really much. And then he asked me what I called a dangerous question. And he said, if you had been involved in this project from the start, would you do anything different? Well, I felt there was some mistakes in the project. So then I went back to him and I said, look, I can, I can answer that question. I have some answers for you, but it's gonna cost you more money. Are you happy about that? And actually he ended up spending probably another 50% of his budget on um, this, this, what you see here now. And as you see this kind of section through here, this all this back section by the dining room was all extra as we took out a whole utility space and opened up the whole um, project um, plan and ended up helping him redefine the value of what he was doing versus the budgets that he wanted to spend. So I'm gonna do this section as well. Um, and Helen is gonna do the last section for us, which is talking about the wisdom or being wise about how you start to make decisions about how to proceed, um, who to choose and who to look at. And I think the very first point which we got there is really what we call resonance. It's a great little phrase of finding people that you connect with and you feel that you can work with. Um, Helen has already touched on the aspect of digging around in some of the deeper things that you feel about your space, the, the heart moments, the special moments that you want to have in your home, in your kitchen space with your family and friends and whatever that means to you. And actually, we, you know, we're, we're nice people. We, we get on with most people, but there's some people that we don't connect with. We're, we're, we're not naturally connected to them. We're not naturally able to really help draw out from them what they wanted to do and, and to be honest with you sometimes we're not the right designers for them and that's okay um, they'll find somewhere somewhere so from our point of view and from your point of view I'd really find somebody who you really feel understands and you can really connect with and you do that by going out having phone conversations with people visiting the sites when we can um, seeing what you like about their studio, seeing what you like about the people, how you're treated, the conversations, the engagements and the questioning, really important. Equally important, if not so more in one sense, is the level of expertise um, that the people have that you're, that you're using. H how do you quantify that? Well, I have this phrase, which you'll, you'll see mentioned in other talks and Helen has touched on it tonight, is what I call the difference between a kitchen planner versus a kitchen designer. 
And if you if you notice, um, everybody in the industry off, off offers um, de design to some degree. Often people, most often people offer free design. Um, that's fine. We don't offer free design. We actually charge for the design that we do for clients because we spend a long time, like kind of just saying in the design process, the products you talked about yesterday for three hours, talking about some really important things, uh, the investment that the client wants to make. But a kitchen planner, I would probably describe to you as somebody who, when you go to see them, they're asking you for your ideas and they're really just placing your ideas into a structured form. That's nothing wrong with that. That's very helpful. Um, but for me, they're not challenging the way that you're thinking and why you're doing something. Is it the best route to doing something? Is there better ways of doing it? Is the architecture right? Is the flow right? Is the space right? And we all have um, an element of ability of design. And as you explore things, you see things that you like on pictures. Um, but a kitchen planner won't really extend you. And you end up, and we have this very often, people walk in and say, well, he kind of put down what we said and he said what we wanted and we've done it. And, you know, it's okay. And it, it, would, it will work because it's what we came up with. From our point of view, if you come to us as design, we have to take you somewhere that you couldn't have gone on your own. And that's why we charge for it. It is refundable off the kitchen. So it doesn't become a, a dead amount of money at the end of the day. There is value um, to that as we go through that whole kind of process to be able to do that. There is a little bit more, like I said, in some of my other talks. Um, track record is, a, is an important thing. Um, the very first slide when we showed you the picture just showed you um, that we've had four years of design awards uh, from house. We won kitchen showroom of the year a few years ago. We've been shortlisted as a finalist in many design awards and won some design awards over, over the years. We obviously we do the design talks. I've been lecturing now at Grand Designs um, for the last five years in London and Birmingham. And I was due to fly out to Orlando next month to go and speak over there at a big kitchen conference. So look for people where you can see a track record of the quality of their expertise, but also look at their uh, portfolio, the work and see if they're doing similar work. Or you feel that if you have something which is really unique and different and special, whether you feel that that designer can really work with you and take you um, beyond that sort of um, basic level. And there's something extra, which I think is, um, there's lots of really good companies around um, producing high quality design. Um, I know a number of them and I know the people that actually own them as well as you'd expect. Um, but the something extra bit is that when you go in there, do you feel deeply listened to? Do you feel really understood? Do you really think that the conversation you've had have drawn something out of you that has surprised you, that has taken you to a place that um, you really, really didn't expect? Do you feel safe, um, not pressurized, not being sold to, but having your ideas developed and expanded? Are you being protected? Um, do you feel um, confident, uplifted, supported and secure um, with the people that you're working with? Really important part of the whole process of design because it allows you to really get exceptional outcome. Um, not necessarily cosmetically, someone else might not see the different, but for you, it's so personal, so individual, and so right for, for you. So I'll just pass back over to Helena. Thank you. So I think the final thing that we really want to share with you is an experience that we have learned from ourselves when we've been dealing with projects. We, uh, a few years ago, uh, were involved in a, a large project with a client who um, was used to handling projects. In fact, he was a project manager for uh, him, himself in his job. And as we as we engaged with um, him and we watched how he made decisions, we came back and had some conversations with each other to the effect of, "Oh wow, didn't that person make decisions?" well didn't they make them quickly but weren't they they just <coughs> seemed to make those those decisions really well and by well i mean um they 
assigned various different experts around them. So this person had a project manager, an interior designer, a kitchen designer, lighting designer. Uh, some people have, are able to have the, or, uh, a number of people around them. Not everybody needs that, but this person had this. Um, and then he would basically ask some questions, listen to the answers, make a decision, move on, ask another set of questions, receive the answers, to make a decision, move on. And there rarely came a time um, for him to change on a decision that was made. In fact, I have to say the only time he did make a decision was when we presented a, a new mm. design idea to him, which he took on board. But the benefits of that was out, you know, far outweighed what the previous idea had been. So it's no wonder he made a good decision there. But why I'm bringing this to you is because I've called this the handshake because there comes a point at which in the journey of your um, trying to find the right partners, finding the right people, you are ready to make decisions. And what I've seen a lot of times is people move from a point of confidence and decision making into a point point of confusion and if you like turmoil um, often the type of person that goes into the confusion is the person who loves to fact, fact gather that's a tongue twister um, maybe has a pile of news uh, resource magazines or cutouts or pinterest boards but it's non-stop it's like um, they have to get more and more facts, like feed me, feed me facts. Um, so many so that they end up confusing themselves very much so. Um, they haven't learned to ask a good question, find out the answer, and then decide on it, and then move on. The power of actually making uh, a, an informed decision does so many things. Um, and that's why I think I'm encouraging you when you find the right partners to go with, whether it's from the electrician down to right the way through to the kitchen designer, is let them know we want you. Let them know I found you, I like what you're saying, we're going to sign up with you. Uh, and then walk through the process that they're offering to you, however that person do, that company deal with that. You see, the commitment in saying, um, I will, or um, or yes, and this not applies to just choosing your partners, but it it's down the line deciding, do you want that sink in this position or this position? Would you like the steam combination oven or the microwave combination? It goes right the way down to liquid decisions. The longer it takes you to make a decision on one thing, the more the brain activity is whirring throughout the day. So, and you have these if you like, unresolved decisions in the back of your head while you're going on your everyday walk. It, they can wake you up at night. They can keep you, you know, they can distract you on your Facebook because they're somewhere in the back of your mind. They're not dealt with. So they're still hanging over you. So I would say release the stress by making quicker decisions that are informed decisions. And what you will find is that releases energy into your um, your project. The way it can release energy is because, I don't know if you've been at the point where you're very excited about something with someone, they're excited about it with you, you're on the same page. There's a point at which you get on the same page with people. And then if that person then goes silent for quite a while, it's probably because they're thinking through a whole lot of things and there is reason to pause on things sometimes. So I'm not saying make quick decisions, um, but when you need to make a decision, make it because then everybody is then ready to move on to the next thing. And in the time frame of a project that we're talking about, we're talking that the allocation of resources and the scheduling of things such as orders, deliveries on a very complex project, such as a, a kitchen build, and especially if it's a new build kitchen build, um, one thing triggers another and before you know it if you haven't made decision one uh, we're sliding down a tunnel and we're losing both time and allocation of resources so I really recommend that what I call the handshake these days it looks in different forms paper forms etc but um, the principle is um, be informed make a decision 
run with it and only look back if you get to a point where you think you might have made a wrong decision and you can revert back. Um, it's really important to release energy into your project. We will be able to help you if uh, we partner with you in helping to make some of those choices by in terms of asking you the right questions so that you're thinking the right way. Um, and I'm sure you have many of the right questions already in your head yourselves. Uh, so we'd just like to leave you with, with that little thought um, and hope that that inspires you and brings energy to your projects. There's a couple of um, four projects here that we've just put as kind of showcases. If you go onto our website and look up project section, you'll see many, many more, and each of them have their own case studies attached to them. But as you can see, whether it's classic, contemporary, whether it's um, uh, minimalist, or family home and um, there's a design that's out there waiting for you it's partly in your heart and it's partly in the hands of the experts to draw that out for you so we hope that this has been helpful in planning your projects um just also just wanted to mention that um a lot of our talks are on youtube we talked about before if you just type in the myers touch under youtube you'll find it hope that's been um, a useful time for you really appreciate you joining us tonight and uh, look forward to seeing you um, hopefully in the studio sometime. There's our phone number and website here if you'd like to make contact with us. Thank you very much and have a good evening and keep safe. Good Thank night. You.